<clears throat> Good morning uh, to my fans and to Michael Moorcock fans everywhere. Uh, I've told you in uh, my video, The Chronicle of the Grey Sword, about uh, the impact of my story, The Materializing Mega City. Unfortunately, the copy that I'll, I have of it on my um, thumb drive has somehow become corrupted. However, I was incorrect about something I said in that video. The Michael Moorcock Miscellany website lives. It just has a new website address, which is michaelmoorcock.net. Um, at that address, there is a section called the Enclave at the End of Time. And in that section, there is the story challenge for 2013, wherein lies my story of the materializing mega city. So without further ado, I am going to read to you now the story which won me that challenge and uh, which had something of an impact that I didn't expect on um, the Citadel of Forgotten Myths. Anyway, without further ado, The Materializing Mega City, a further tale of Eric of Marylebone, as chronicled by Wolf, White Wolf 359. That's me. Uh, that's kind of an in joke, and no, I'm not going to let you in on it. Prelude. In the beginning, there were the two swords. Created by the ancient foreign sorceress Fafnir the Great, they were the Black Sword, sometimes known as Stormbringer or Kena Jaina, and the White Sword, known as the Sword of Law or Cloud Hurler. The two swords were diametrically opposed. Stormbringer was created to serve the Lords of Chaos and their chosen champions, and had the power to steal the souls of the living and feed their energy to its masters. Cloud Hurler was meant to be wielded by the champions of the Lords of Law, and... <laughs> Although as deadly as Stormbringer, it could also heal the morally bankrupt before they died, restoring their souls to purity. But the swords were created for another purpose that Thafnir kept secret from even the lords of the higher worlds. Each blade was enchanted with a special rune. When the song Rune of Thafnir was sung in the original foreign language by a magician powerful enough to withstand the harshness of the syllables on his or her tongue and the power of the firm, foreign magic upon his or her mind, then the sword could be con combined to form the Grey Sword, Shadow Stealer, which had the power to steal the souls of not only ordinary mortals, but the lords of the higher worlds themselves. This room was created as a hedge against a day when the lords of the higher worlds threatened to destroy the cosmic balance with their petty wars. This knowledge was so secret that Thafnir hid it from even her own race and their descendants, the Melnibonaeans. But a powerful <clears throat> Melnibonean sorceress, Tashikar of Imrir, discovered the rune of Thafnir on a dream quest and wrote it all down when she woke. She died immediately afterwards, but the scroll of Thafnir was hidden by her lover and passed on to her lover's daughter and her daughter and her daughter's daughter and so on. Ten thousand years later, even as the bright empire of Melnibone fell, and the last guardians of the scroll of Thafnir uh, fell in love with the beautiful and buxom red-haired wench who was, unknown to her, a priestess of Queen Siombarg of Chaos. Using her <coughs> sorcery and her supple body, she <coughs> loosed her lover's tongue into revealing the sacred skull scroll's location. So began the little-known and forgotten War of the Grey Sword, also known as the Shadow Seduction. Chronicle of the Black Sword, Excise Chapter 93.4 1. <clears throat> I had too much to dream last night. Bookseller <clears throat> Margus Tan knew he was a dead man when the three red-haired priestesses of Siomborg entered his shop. There could only be one item in his possession worthy of the attention of the flame-haired beauties. He knew precisely what they wanted before, <clears throat> before the tallest and prettiest of them spoke. He didn't even wait for her to ask him for the scroll. He climbed on the ladder, reached <clears throat> behind a hidden shelf, and produced the black scroll tied with a crimson ribbon. He climbed back down and laid it on the counter. It is very ancient, Margus declared. I would... I would caution you to handle it with the utmost delicacy. It would be a shame if it were to crumble to dust. It is, as you are no doubt aware, the only copy of the scroll of Thafnir in existence. The beauty nodded silently. She took the scroll and placed it gingerly in her knapsack. And now, since you're going to kill me, I ask only that you be merciful and swift. The old bookseller coughed. 
The second beauty drew a large electric blue broadsword from her <coughs> from the sheath across her back and deftly beheaded the elderly bookseller slash magician. He died with a sad look on his face. He had hoped to live to be 150. Tomorrow would have been his birthday. His body fell to the floor. It was a sunny day, but his corpse cast no shadow. The third priestess of Siamborg <coughs> smiled knowingly as they departed into the hot sunlight of the sighing desert and <coughs> mounted their dragons. Mary LeBun London, 25,000 years later, May 9th, 1969. Eric awoke in a green hotel, a strange creature groaning beside him. The sheets were hot, dead prisons. He coughed and cleared his <coughs> roomy pink eyes. The creature was his lovely Aunt Valerie. Her golden hair spilled across her white, soft skin like a shroud. He snored softly from she snored softly from last night's passionate lovemaking and ingestion of psychedelic mushrooms. Eric was still suffering from the hallucinogens. He imagined that there was another girl in the room. She was a beautiful buxom brunette with a horse's head and hooves and no shadow. Queen Siambarg needs you, Sir Champion. The horse-headed girl whinnied. Come to the conjunction of the million spheres at midnight tonight. It is your destiny. You cannot refuse. Then the beauty vanished in a puff of golden vapor, leaving behind a pleasant peppermint smell. Eric shook his head and washed his face in the flat, small bathroom. Those mushrooms were trippy stuff. He laughed at the image of the horse-headed girl and tried to shake the cobwebs from his brain. Why had she had no shadow? That seemed an odd detail for a hallucination. Eric ate some breakfast cereal and made a cup of Earl Grey. He looked at the kitchen clock and realized it was already two o'clock in the afternoon. The weather condition outside was cloudy and gray, which was perfect for walking around weather for him. He was an albino and had to avoid direct sunlight. He decided to go out. He left his Aunt Valerie some hot tea and a brief note. Despite the damp, dark weather, Eric brought his black sunglasses and a broad-brimmed gray fedora. <clears throat> he put on his red and black pirate jacket, leather trousers, and boots. He looked very hip indeed. Out on the Edgware Road, Eric was surprised to see <coughs> flyers for a new club called, quote-unquote, the Conjunction of the Million Spheres, which was even odder was the photograph on the ba background. It was printed in pale blue, but it appeared to be a beautiful woman with a horse's head and hooves. Eric figured the mushrooms were still not 100% out of his system. He laughed and at the recurring images, and Wade walked into a used bookstore. While he was browsing through paperbacks, he ran into his old friend Rory Greenstock. Rory was a fat, bald man with a broad smile and breath that stank of Bacon Buddies and Boddington's Pub Ale. He was the guitarist in a terrible acid rock band called the French Crocodiles. His <coughs> playing was awful, and his Fender Telecaster was constantly out of tune. <clears throat> but he was nice and a nice enough person. He loved old books, and he had an encyclopedic knowledge of London rock and roll clubs and which bands were playing <clears throat> where on any given night. He also usually had good weed, which he shared at reasonable prices. Hi, Eric, Rory yelled. How you been, mate? Ain't seen you in a dog's age. I'm okay, Eric said. He browsed casually through some Michael Moorcock titles looking for rare editions. He particularly liked the Jerry Cornelius stories, but didn't find any in the bookstore's paltry bins. Although they had a few tattered copies of The Eternal Champion and a moth-eaten stealer of souls with torn covers. Coming down off a mushroom trip, though, though, still getting some weird imagery. Shrooms, Rory said. Got any more? I ain't done a, a mushroom trip in a month or two. Nah, they weren't mine, Eric said. They were my Aunt Valerie's and... We did last the last of them last night before we shagged. You shag your auntie? <laughs> Rory laughed. That's far out, man. She's not really my aunt, Eric replied. She's just a friend of my, my of me mom. She raised me after the car accident that killed my parents. Oh, well, I guess that's hip, Rory said. I mean, love is totally groovy. Is your band playing any gigs? Eric said. He was eager to change the subject. No, Rory replied. 
uh, after that debacle at Shepherd's Bush where Peter forgot the lyrics to Power Trip, we can't get any gigs. But I know there's this really great band that's playing tonight. It's an all-girl psychedelic group called the Steel Ponies, and they're playing right here at the conjunction of the Million Spheres, uh, that new club in Baker Street. Here's a flyer. These girls are all lookers, man, and they wear <laughs> these wild leather pony suits and wail on guitar. He handed Eric a bill, a blue and white handbill. It was written in weird fonts and it read, Come see the Steel Ponies, the grooviest band in London, 258 Baker Street, one night only, with Love Coven, Coven and the Kim Cat Band, 12 midnight, 6 May 1969. See the dazzling conjuration of the Million Spheres acid <coughs> light show. Come one, come all. Tickets, four pounds. The background image was the same one Eric had seen on the street. I think I'll come see this show, Eric said. It sounds far out. Yeah, they're great, Rory said. I have some good shit, too. I'll meet you there. Uh, I have to go. If you pay for you pay for the tickets and drinks, I'll give you some <coughs> primo Tijuana gold I just scored from <coughs> Chapman himself. See you tonight, mate. He clapped Eric on the shoulder a bit too hard and stumbled out into the cool street. Eric ate lunch at a small pub on the Marylebone Road called the Blue Rose. It was dark and quiet and felt comfortable. He felt comfortable at his wooden corner booth. Another pint of lager, love? The buxom barmaid, a lovely redhead <coughs> named Connie, asked him. Uh, yeah, great, Connie, Eric said. He was trying to figure out the recurring horse head images. What did they mean? Why were they happening... Uh, why were they happening? Who was Queen Siambarg, and why did he feel he'd heard that name before? Eric's memory was a little like a sheet of Swiss cheese that were whole periods he had for forgotten. He figured it was just a combination of drugs and trauma. He had been through some wild adventures, but he wasn't sure if they were dreams, hallucinations, or just his vivid imagination. The earliest of these strange episodes <coughs> concerned the deaths of his parents, he was told over and over that Lord Allen von Beck and Lady Cassandra von Beck had been killed when their Jaguar XKE had careened off the road and collided with a light pole near Vol Bridge. But that's not what the young boy had remembered. He recalled a night when his parents had thrown a grand gala at their mansion in Kew Gardens. They often held lavish parties. This one had been a fancy dress ball. All of the guests had worn marvelous and colorful costumes. Lady Margaret Wickham had come as Marie Antoinette, carrying her severed head in a basket. Lord Henry Allard had come as Superman, and his wife, Connie, had come as Wonder Woman. Sir Peter Gridley had arrived in a wonderful pirate gear as Blackbeard, the ends of his hair lit on fire. Count Thomas Iannucci had come as Cesare Borgia, dressed in all black velvet. The handsome lords and ladies had danced, laughed, and snuck off to shag at a as a 30-piece band orchestra played Strauss waltzes. Then an unannounced guest had arrived. She was a strange and alluring woman, tall and curvaceous with a lovely face and a strange almond-shaped eyes. They were a very deep shade of emerald green and seemed to glow from within. Her long, lustrous hair was neither brown nor red, but chestnut with subtle undertones of rose, lavender, and pink streaked through it. She moved with a strange gliding motion, as if her feet were not actually in contact with the ground, but supported by an invisible cushion of air. The time has come, the strange beauty had said to Lord and Lady Von Beck. Our bargain must be kept. What about the boy, Lady Cassandra? Had asked the strange woman. What will happen to my son? You mean my son? The redhead had replied. No harm will come to him. You know that. You know how important he is to the, my future plans. He'll be well cared for. You need not worry on that account. It seems unfair to burst in on the, us like this, Lord Von Beck had replied. It is midnight. <clears throat> Your steeds await, the woman replied. She led them out onto the stone-glazed balcony and into the rose garden. There, two magnificent pearl-white dragons with crimson eyes pawed at the muddy ground. They each had a black leather saddle uh, on their slender necks. Remember, their slender necks, Brett, what? met their broad shoulders and wing roots. His father and mother each mounted a dragon. The red-haired woman sung, 
some words in a strange, keening language, and the dragons flapped into the summer sky and flew away, taking his parents with them. They vanished in, in a golden puffs of cloud and were gone. When, <clears throat> when Eric ran downstairs to confront the woman, she was gone, too, as were the party guests. In the morning, the police came around. They told him that his parents had died in a car crash. The elaborate fancy dress party, the red-haired woman, and the dragons had all been a dream. Worse, his father had been in debt, and the mansion was heavily mortgaged. He would have to go live with his Aunt Valerie in her two-room flat in, in the Edgware Road. The house would have to be sold to pay off creditors, as would the majority of his father's assets. He had, in essence, no inheritance. Daydreaming, love? Connie asked. Coming down off a mushroom trip, Connie, Eric admitted. <clears throat> the lager helps. Can I get another pint? Uh, he laid down two pound no coins. He was getting <clears throat> low on cash. He would have to sell <clears throat> some drugs or pawn some records soon. He only received a small allowance from Aunt Valerie, 20 bob a month. That was all he she could afford. She was a seamstress and made some extra money dancing at a strip club in Shepherd's Bush. Eric couldn't <clears throat> work at a normal job due to his sensitive skin and poor eyesight, but he got odd jobs here and there. He was good at tinkering car engines, and a mechanic friend helped him out with a few quid here and there. It was a poor living, but he managed to keep out <clears throat> keep one step ahead of the poorhouse with a little help from his friends. Eric drank his lager and thought about his strange and fascinating hallucinations. Two, she's not there. Acid rock <clears throat> music blared out of the doors of the tiny club. <clears throat> the conjunction of the million spheres was so small, Eric could barely fit in the door. Blank gray building between a fish and chips shop and a coin laundromat. The club was far from glamorous. It was filled with pot smoke, smoking hippies, and Eric could hardly see through the bluish pot haze and flashing strobe lights on the small stage. The band playing was Love Coven, six pretty girls who sang well and played adequately, but were not any different than five or six other quote-unquote girl groups Eric had heard recently. They lacked anything new or innovative to set them apart. They were playing a cover of <clears throat> She's Not There by the Zombies as he staggered into the cramped, cramped interior of the club. Worst of all, Roy Greenstock had done a runner on him, leaving him to pay for his own ticket without any marijuana. Eric Darling, a fawning female voice called. He whirled to find the, <clears throat> the source and got elbowed in the stomach by a dancing fat boy. He pitched forward, howling in pain, and practically fell into the arms of an old friend of Aunt Valerie's, Madge Kensington, a vapid, a pretty vapid blonde with a nice smile and a pleasant personality. Madge liked to act more hip than her age. She was 45, but looked 30. Hi, Madge, <clears throat> Eric answered. He tried to push past a couple of hippies kissing. He couldn't tell in the strobe lights if it was two blokes, two girls and a bloke, or, <clears throat> or a bloke and a girl. Uh, this isn't, <clears throat> this lot isn't much good, Madge said, pointing to Love Coven. But the next band is good, and wait until you see the Steel Ponies. They're great, or groovy, or whatever the in phrase is this week. Eric sidled up to, the, <clears throat> to Madge and tried to get a better view of the stage. The strobe lights were killing his sensitive eyes. He had <clears throat> to put on his black sunglasses just to see normally. The club was now dark, but clearer to Eric's eyes. He could still see well enough to watch the Love Coven finish their set. There was an in intermission between the next group, the Kim Cat Band, set up. He said a polite goodbye to Madge and made his way to the bar. He had no chance with her Madge anyway. She liked girls. Eric ordered a lager and jostled his way to one of the few <clears throat> actual seats in the club. He hadn't realized how much his back hurt until he sat down. <clears throat> now he could at least relax a bit more. For some reason, he was feeling very tense and nervous. The pervasive pot smoke was making him mellow, and he felt almost fell asleep during the Kim Cat Band set of Rolling Stones, The Who, and Beatles covers. After about 20 minutes, they left the stage to little applause. There was a, a ten-minute intermission before the Steel Ponies came on. Then the place went wild. Ladies and gentlemen, the band you've been waiting for, the Steel Ponies, the announcer, a fat teddy boy, shouted. The crowd roared. On drums, the lovely Linda Lace, the announcer said. A tall, buxom woman dressed in a canary-yellow catsuit and matching leather horse head sat down at the drum kit. 
on bass guitar, tantalizing Tanya tees. Tanya was even taller, dressed in crimson leather with, <clears throat> with horse hoof boots. On rhythm guitar, sexy Sandra Simmons, the teddy boy said. Sandra was a vision in purple leather. On lead vocals, your leader, wild Wendy Willits. The announcer shouted. Wendy's red hair spilled from beneath her red pony mask. Her long, lean body was lovingly caressed by her electric blue cat suit. Last but not least, on keyboards, naughty Natasha Varishkova, the, <clears throat> the announcer said. Natasha was a super buxom Russian beauty dressed all in white leather over ample curves. The steel ponies, the teddy boy shouted. The crowd roared so loudly, Eric couldn't hear them tuning up. They launched into an acid rock favorite, Incense and Peppermints by Strawberry Alarm Clock. The crowd cheered and hollered as Wendy belted out the tor torchy version of the hipster classic. And then they launched into a rollicking version of White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane that lasted nearly 20 minutes. The crowd seemed hypnotized by the hip-wriggling, hand-clapping band <coughs> members. Eric found it hard to take his eyes off the curvy keyboardist's ample chest. He dug the music. The Steel Ponies were good. They launched into a strange and hypnotic number called The Chronicle of the Grey Sword that had the crowd applauding and dancing wildly. The song was atonal and the words made no sense, but Eric found that he was glued to his chair, unable to move. The bass beat seemed to paralyze him. It penetrated his flesh and seemed to merge with his mind. It felt as if, as if the notes were inside him, manipulating his very atoms. Finally, the Chronicle of the Grey Sword flared to an end with a dramatic drum solo by Linda Lace, a crescendo of hammering guitar licks by Wendy Willits, and a toccata by Busty <coughs> Natasha Varishkova. The crowd cheered and but seemed more relieved than happy. A winsome waitress handed Eric a handwritten note sealed with the five, five lipstick kisses. It read, The ponies want you. Come backstage. Eric accompanied the waitress to a small black door with, a str with strange red runes painted on it behind the soundstage. The door led to a dressing room that was larger than the, than the club. Eric was surprised to see how spacious the back room was in comparison. Ah, there you are, Wendy Willis said from beneath her leather pony mask. We saw you digging our song. You were really getting into it, weren't you? I guess I was, Eric admitted. It was almost seen the other way around, as if your music was getting into me. It affects some people that way, the buxom Natasha replied. She had taken off her white pony head. She was a beautiful ice blonde with penetrating light blue eyes and Slavic features. Special people. That's why we wanted to see you, Tanya Tease replied. She too had removed her pony head to reveal her teak brown hair, small nose, and pretty features. She had taken off her hoof boots and was rubbing her sore feet. Also, why our mistress Sarantha summoned you here, Linda Lay said. Without her pony mask, she was an ash blonde, buxom beauty. Only the rhythm guitarist Sandra Simmons, the sexy girl in purple leather, had not removed her horse head. She turned to face Eric and he suddenly felt afraid. He could not see the zipper on her leather pony head. Her eyes were deep and black, and he felt certain the pony's head on her slender shoulders was real. Who are you? Eric asked the horse-headed woman. She, woman. she moved towards him, and he realized she cast no shadow. Mr. Sarantha, the horse-headed woman replied, forgive me if my true <coughs> appearance frightens you. Perhaps you would prefer a more familiar form. She transformed before his eyes into the woman he'd seen in his parents' ballroom, the chestnut-headed beauty with the glowing green eyes. But... You don't exist, Eric stammered. Who said so? Sandra laughed. All those child psychiatrists and social workers my Aunt Valerie sent me to, Eric replied. They said you weren't real. I'd made you up to mask my, my grief over my parents' death in the car crash. But you know better, Sandra replied. You saw them fly it on their foreign mounts. <clears throat> fly away on their foreign mounts. You know they're not dead. They were returned to their own dimension. I don't understand, Eric said. He felt dizzy and unable to stand. Valerie helped him into a white leather sofa. You were not meant to understand those events, Sandra explained. But they did happen, Eric. You were not dreaming or hallucinating. You said I was your son, Eric remembered. Are you my mother? Sandra laughed. It sounded like a horse's whinny rather than human laughter. You took me too literally, Sandra replied. When I said you were my child... I, I did not mean that I'd had sexual relations with your father or mother. 
I did, but they did not produce you. You are your parents' son, but my kind serve the lords of chaos, and so do you. You were born to serve my mistress, Queen Siambarg of Chaos. Who is Queen Siambarg? Eric asked. Why does that name sound so familiar to me? You are her champion, Sandra <coughs> said. You have been on many missions for <coughs> the secret queen, though she has erased your memory of most of them. The lords of the higher worlds are sometimes cruel and capricious. So too can they be generous with their gifts. You are a special being, Eric. You have the power to wield chaos weapons that would destroy mere mortals. You are the wielder of the colored swords. But I am mortal, Eric objected. You speak as if I were a god or a non-human being. Not non-human, Sandra corrected, but immortal nonetheless. You're a manifestation of the eternal champion. You are reflected in a million worlds in a million different lives, even if you cannot perceive them consciously. What does that nonsense mean? Eric asked. You are really blowing my mind, lady. Three, not to touch the earth. Eric Porterfield von Beck, Sandra said in a commanding voice. You were summoned here by the Queen, Queen Siambar to fulfill your purpose. Behold, the conjunction of the million spheres. She waved her arms <clears throat> and the walls of the club melted away. Suddenly they were alone and standing in infinite space. Around them he saw literally millions of glass spheres, each sphere a separate universe, as Sandra or Mistress Sarantha had <clears throat> described. In each of these worlds was a champion, and they were all him. Some were tall, some short, some black, red, yellow, white, or even green. Some were men, some women, some hermaphrodites. One was a gargantuan white bear, and another was an enormous white ancient white dragon, but they were all somehow all Eric or versions of Eric. Wow, Eric proclaimed. What is this place? Why have you brought me here? Because Queen Siambarg commands it, Sarantha replied. Her horse head had returned. What are we supposed to do? Eric asked. He felt dizzy and confused. The conjunction of the million spheres was too grand for one mind to comprehend. Find one extremely rare version of London. <clears throat> Sarantha replied. It appears only once every 200 million years. There, over the horizon, look. As Eric watched, a huge structure materialized on what appeared to be a desert planet. The sands were bleak and tawny, but with a huge gust of air like the world's biggest dust devil, a great black structure began to appear. It was a huge three-limbed <clears throat> column with a dome at the top, miles in circumference. It stood <clears throat> on three great black metal pylons supported on the desert floor and rose 40 miles into the sky. Under the dome, Eric saw the lights of a familiar city. It was London, but under glass. Behold, the mega city of London, <clears throat> Mr. Sir Arthur whinnied. This is a distant future. In your terms, it would be the year 25,000 AD, but those terms do not really apply here. It is the London year 240915, and you have a destiny in that city. You must recover the gray sword from the, the, <clears throat> the palace of the Amber Queen. They began to cross the desert on foot, and wicked winds whipped up into their faces. Eric covered his face with his black scarf. Sarantha did not seem bothered by the sound. Eric had <clears throat> not noticed but the other band members, now with real horse heads, were following a few paces behind. Natasha walked to his right, Wendy to his left, Linda and Tanya behind. The party slowly moved across the desert toward the impossible structure. Who built the mega city? Eric inquired. Neo-Londoners, Natasha replied. A race of advanced humans who <clears throat> use both technology and sorcery. They are post-human, Sarantha corrected. They have altered their DNA to adapt to the high altitude and higher solar radiation of Mega London. We will, we will have to take anti-radiation uh, and altitude sickness medications before our arrival. The neo londoners will be suspicious of us, Natasha said. We can change our outward appearance as they can, but you cannot. Some of them are gynomorphic as well. What does that mean? Eric asked. They can change gender at will, Sarantha said. For that reason, you should avoid all gender-based forms of address such as sir or miss, Natasha said. Instead, use Londoner, citizen, or mate. Wow, that's heavy, Eric said. <clears throat> that may take some getting used to. As you, 
you will see many things will be familiar, but many alien, Sarantha replied. Try not to use terms like groovy or square because they don't mean anything in this culture. There are new terms you will learn like skyward or flash, but don't try to understand them right away. Yeah, I get it. Things are different here, Eric said. How long till we get there? I can't take much more of this desert heat. You are under Queen Zeomborg's magical protection, Sandra slash Zarantha replied. No harm will come to you from the desert sun or the heat of the day. It will take us three days to cross the nearest pylon. Here, this is this anti-radiation, take this anti-radiation pill now. She handed him a bright cyan tablet with a circle of eight yellow arrows printed on it. He reluctantly swallowed it, hoping, hoping it wasn't a trick, like his Aunt Valerie's lipstick hallucinogens. Finally, they could walk no more. Zarantha chanted some runes in a strange sing-song language and a stone shelter appeared. They walked inside, glad to be out of the whipping winds and scorching sun. There was no night in this place, and the only darkness they experienced was inside the shelter. Inside the small stone building, there was only one large room, and five of them huddled for warmth. Mr. Sarantha transformed back into her human shape and kissed Eric passionately. Natasha joined in, and the three of them made passionate love for four hours, then fell into a deep sleep. Eric dreamed of horses and pastel-colored swords. 4. A magic Carpet Ride The next morning, Eric, Mr. Zarantha, and Natasha Vereshkova made love again until the dawn sunlight broke over the horizon. Tanya and Linda and Wendy were engaged in their own passionate love in, preferring their own company. Finally, they all got dressed and walked into the scorching morning heat. The sun that shone on the desert was redder than Eric remembered, and he had to wear his black shades, fedora, and veil to keep from getting a nasty sunburn. They walked on towards the forbidding structure of Neo London, which cast long shadows across the sand. Why do you have no shadow? Eric asked Mr. Zarantha. You will find that out in time, Zarantha answered cryptically. It has to do with your mission. You mentioned a gray sword. And your song was called The Chronicle of the Grey Sword, but what is the Grey Sword? A magical weapon, Sarantha replied, one of the most dangerous ever dreamed of. It is a combined weapon, made from the melding of a chaos weapon known as Stormbringer and a law sword known as Cloud Hurler. Melded by ancient sorcerer's rune, they become Shadow Stealer, the Grey Sword. Why is Shadow Stealer so dangerous? Eric asked. Because it can destroy even the lords of the higher worlds, Sarantha replied. They fear it because it serves neither law nor chaos, but the cosmic balance itself. If the balance is threatened, the gray sword appears to defend it. I thought you said I was born to serve chaos, Eric said. So why would I be able to wield a weapon that could destroy chaos entities? Because you are an aspect of the eternal champion, Sarantha <coughs> replied. Only a champion can wield Shadow Stealer. Suddenly a great column of dust erupted from the desert floor. The dust devil whirled madly around them. From the midst of the column, an astonishingly beautiful woman appeared. She stood 20 feet tall, and her figure was even more stunning than Natasha's, fulsome and curvaceous, the perfection of the female form. Eric felt tears stream down his face at the glimpse of her beautiful face, the face of a Nordic goddess, but dark-haired and fiery. There was an aspect of flame about her that caused all the hairs on his body to stand up. He felt as if every molecule of his body was on fire, but it was not painful, but joyous fire. He knew then that she was the original flame, Queen Siambarg of Chaos. My servant, her lovely voice, the voice of fire and ice, spoke. You must recover the gray sword for me. You must restore my feminine shadow to the multiverse. Do this for me, your queen, and you shall receive great rewards. Serve my slave Zarantha and obey her commands. We shall meet again. When you have completed your mission, beware the servant of my enemy, Lord Ariok, a golden-haired temptress called the Amber Queen. She is alluring, but resist her charms and steal from her the gray sword. Then the image of Queen Siomberg faded into the desert sand like a mirage. Did you see that? Eric asked Sarantha. See what? Sarantha asked. She took her horses, shook her horse's head and continued to walk toward the nearest pylon of Neo London, the towering megacity. I guess it was a mirage, Eric replied. He wiped sweat from his brow. He knew his vision of Queen Sjomberg had not been a mirage. He had spoken with the original flame, the beautiful lady of chaos. He knew she was untrustworthy, a seductress and a liar, but he also knew that she, he was powerless to resist her overwhelming will and unearthly beauty. 
he would do as she willed and recover the gray sword from the palace of the Amber Queen. When the red sun set over the tawny sands, Mr. Sarantha sang another rune and summoned a shelter. Eric, Natasha, and Zarantha slept together, as did Linda, Wendy, and Tanya. They were all so exhausted from the day's march through the desert that they all fell asleep within five minutes. Eric had a strange dream. He was walking through familiar streets of Maryland, but they kept changing. One moment he was standing by a fish and chip stop, stop, shop with Rory Greenstock smoking a joint. The next he was standing on a high platform watching a huge green airship painted with fanciful Chinese dragons. Standing by his left side was a beautiful red-haired woman with a red sword on a scabbard at her left hip. Then he was on the shore of a drowned London, fishing from a small coracle with a buxom brunette. Next, he was <clears throat> fighting an army of ant-like humanoids on a red world with a blue sun. In the last dream before he woke, he was in a luxurious palace in a huge bed with red satin sheets, making love, passionate love to his Aunt Valerie. Yet somehow she wasn't his Aunt Valerie. She had Valerie's face and body, but she was a great queen. Eric woke with a start covered with cold sweat. He disentangled himself from Natasha and Zarantha and stood panting until he <clears throat> felt his heart rate return to normal. Then he lay back down beside his beautiful companions and fell into a lighter, dreamless sleep. They reached the pylon by midday. The huge black limb was nearly a mile wide, a great circle of matte black steel stabbing into the tawny sand. As they approached, Eric saw that the structure was, <clears throat> was not featureless. There were many seams, slats, and strange-looking electronic panels built into the pylon. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Sarantha walked up to one of the old, odd electronic devices and punched in an elaborate code. Blue, red, and green triangular panels lit up in a hypnotic sequence, and Eric heard a series of clicks and beeps. I have summoned a lift, Sarantha said, but it'll take six hours to arrive. Take these pills. She handed Eric and the steel ponies each two two pills, one of the blue anti-radiation tablets and a bright green gelatin capsules containing a cure for altitude sickness. They waited patiently for the arrival of the lift. After what seemed like an eternity, there was a, there was a noise like the hiss of a thousand snakes, and a panel in the great pylon opened. They stepped inside a cobalt blue lighted elevator. Inside were six glass tubes. These are stasis chambers, Mr. Sarantha explained. Step inside, you will be protected by the stasis field from the harmful G-forces generated by the lift's acceleration. The trip to Mega London will take 14 hours, but you will not feel any passage of time. Eric reluctantly entered a tube next to Zarantha. The world flashed a bright purple as the stasis field engulfed him. The next thing he knew, he was standing in Baker Street, but it wasn't his Baker Street. It was a fabulous ab avenue lit with bioluminescent green plants and lined <clears throat> with brilliant pastel glass skyscrapers twisted into fantastic shapes. Above, <clears throat> above him, great airships shaped like green dragons, Siamese fighting fish, silver butterflies, and golden beetles hovered and danced. The people were like none he'd ever seen, tall and beautiful, dressed in a thousand different styles. They looked more like Egyptian gods and goddesses than humans. There were beautiful women with cow heads, muscular men with hawk heads, shambling gorillas with human faces. It was certainly not his London. Wow, Eric proclaimed, this place is far out. It's like a dream. Careful, Mr. Sarantha replied. She took his elbow and guided him away from a horse-headed neo-Londoner in a green silk dress. He slash she had been staring at Eric in an odd way. Not everyone here is friendly. Even Queen Siambarg has enemies. The six of them walked down Baker Street toward the Marylebon Road, avoiding most, <clears throat> most of the exotic Neo-Londoners. When they'd almost reached Dorset Street, a band of ten warrior women in gray skirts and tunics and black leather thigh boots surrounded them. They drew long silver sabers from their backs and pointed them at their throats. Halt! The leader, a stunning woman with long white blonde hair, shouted, You are under arrest by the Amber Queen's guard. You are trespassers. Our magical sensors have detected that you are servants of our of the enemy of our patron, Duke Ariok of Chaos. You will come with us to the royal dungeons to be interrogated. Five, honky-tonk women. <clears throat> the sexy queen's guards led Eric and the steel ponies down the Edgware Road to a strange building he'd never seen before. The royal dungeon was an imposing rectangle of gray stone that looked like <clears throat> a Russian gulag. 
There were towers at the four corners with crenellated tops and guards staring down at them with deadly looking rifles in their arms. Eric and the five women were frog marched up a small flight of steps into an imposing iron door sculpted with fearsome dragons. Two beautiful women carrying long pythes stood guard. They parted for the Amber Queen's guard and opened the door, which groaned and creaked like the doors to ca <coughs> Castle Frankenstein in an old horror movie. Eric could barely see a thing inside. It was so pitch black. Where are you taking us? Eric asked a blonde Queen's guard. The woman stared at him with her odd electric blue eyes and merely shoved him down the dark corridor. Eric was pushed into a small cell about 25 feet by 25 feet. A barred iron door was locked. The steel ponies were led off down the corridor. Eric heard hushed voices and whispers, but nothing more. The cell was so dark he couldn't even see the walls. He groped along the left side wall and found a small cot. He lay down and waited for whatever fate was to befall him. An overwhelming exhaustion washed over Eric and he could not resist. He fell into a deep ensorcelled sleep. In his dreams, he was in a white room with no windows. Four beautiful women with bone white hair and magnificent bosoms were questioning him and discussing him as if he was not present. He is of the old blood, the prettiest of them, a beauty with pine green eyes, stated matter-of-factly. He is one of us, a second blonde goddess stated. She was some kind of sorceress dressed in a blue and gold form-fitting robes that were <clears throat> embroidered with fanciful crimson, gold, and lilac runes and symbols. Eric recognized some of the spells. They were from the forbidden grimoire once known as the Dead God's Book. He knows the foreign spells. He can read the runes even now. Then the mission is clear. The third blonde, a busty beauty with ice blue eyes, pronounced, he is destined to wield the great sword. But if he does, it could destroy our patron, Lord Ariok, the fourth woman, a lean lady with amber eyes, countered. We must not let this happen. We should destroy him now. He is the champion eternal, the sorceress said. We cannot destroy him. If we kill this incarnation, another will follow. Sister Willow is right. We must give him the gray sword. But if Ariok falls, Sister Willow replied, then we will serve Queen Siambard, the sorceress replied. It is done. Wake him. He must meet the Amber Queen. It is his destiny. Eric woke with a start and found four of the Queen's Amber Guards in his cell, their swords drawn. Get up, outsider, the nearest guard shouted. She yanked Eric painfully to his feet. You have an audience with the Amber Queen. He was escorted through a maze of, <coughs> of damp, dimly lit corridors by the Queen's guards until he came to a golden room lit with red braziers. Eric saw the steel ponies, each flanked by two lovely Queen's guards, standing at the left of a large raised dais. At the center of the platform was a dragon-shaped throne carved from a single great fire opal sparkling with a thousand brilliant and beautiful colors. Seated upon the throne was a woman who was a dead ringer for Eric's <coughs> Aunt Valerie. Her hair was longer, and her face had a slightly elfin cast uh, with almond-shaped eyes and <clears throat> bow-shaped lips, but she was almost identical to Valerie Porterfield in every other way, including a stunning figure which was barely concealed in a gorgeous golden dress embroidered with blue and red silk dragons. The dress was v-necked and slit high along the right side. At her hip was a slender saber in, saber in a black scabbard. Approach, the Amber Queen said. Elric was led to the third step of the platform to a red velvet chair. He sat obediently staring up at the Amber Queen. I understand you seek something of mine, stranger, the Amber Queen spoke. Her voice was high and lilting with a strange accent Eric could not place. Yes, your majesty, Eric said. I came to your fair city on a quest. I seek the sword known as Shadow Stealer, the Gray Sword. You want <coughs> to steal my most prized possession, the Amber Queen replied. Not steal it, my liege, Eric replied. It seemed to him that for a moment that the dragon throne was alive and that its emerald green eyes were observing him keenly, but recover it for its rightful owner, Queen Siambarg of Chaos. There were gasps from the Queen's guards when Eric mentioned Siambarg's name. You dare speak the name of my enemy in my own palace? The Amber Queen replied. She stroked the hilt of her silver saber with a slender white hand. How lovely she was, Eric thought. He was awestruck by her otherworldly beauty. She is not your enemy, Eric replied. She is only the enemy of darkness and evil. She is the enemy of our patron, Duke Ariok of Chaos, the Amber Queen countered. For that reason alone, I cannot allow you, her champion eternal, to possess the Grey Sword. 
As she spoke his name, there came a sudden burst of golden light. From it emerged a beautiful young man with golden hair and eyes, the chosen avatar of Duke Ariok. You are not the one I expected, the Chaos Lord spoke. He stared at Eric with a dumbfounded look. I know you. You defeated my champion, Elwyn of Brussels. You bore the red sword, Fire Spitter. I do not recall those events, Eric replied. He felt a shock of recognition. He knew this young Chaos Lord from somewhere, but could not recall any details. No, of course not, Ariok stated. She erased your memory once you had done her evil bidding. I have only your word for that, Eric laughed. I know, you, know of you, Duke Ariok. You are a lord of lies. I cannot trust a thing you say to be true. Nonetheless, I speak the truth at this time, Eric Porterfield von Beck, Ariok stated. You are of the old blood, the lineage of the Furn and the Melnivoneans. Yes, this could be amusing. Amberiana, let him have the gray sword. I believe he will do the right thing. Are you certain this is wise, Duke Ariok? The Amber Queen asked the Chaos Lord. So we shall see, Ariok answered. So be it, the lovely Amber Queen replied. She waved her hands in the air and made strange gestures and sang something in a lovely alien tongue. The air crackled with blue electricity, and with a thunderclap, the gray sword appeared, hanging in midair before her. Come, Eric. Take Shadow Stealer, your destiny. Six, in the year 2525, the gray sword hung before the Amber Queen, its gray radiance bathing the room in a strange glow. The crystal dragon throne seemed to shift, and Eric swore its curved head lifted to observe the room blade hanging in midair. He felt a powerful pull as if the sword was literally drawing him forward. He moved as if in a dream, his feet moving without his guidance toward the blade. He took it from the air, and it settled into his grip as naturally as an appendage. As soon as his hand touched the hilt of the sword, there was a brilliant emerald green flash, and Queen Siomborg stood upon the dais, smiling benignly. You have it now. Destroy my enemy, Queen Siomborg commanded. She pointed at Duke Ariok. Oddly, Ariok did not seem frightened. Elric felt all the hairs on his body stand on end, and his vision became electric blue, then crimson, then emerald. He saw that within the Grey Sword itself, powerful forces fought for dominion. The black blade known as Stormbringer, which thrilled for souls to devour, and the white blade, Cloud Hurler, which yearned to enlighten the mad and save all the lost souls of the multiverse. The struggle was mirrored in a million worlds and in a myriad of dimensions. Eric felt dizzy as the Grey Sword showed him the true form of Ariok, a gaseous monstrosity with millions of writhing tentacles and a huge black beak like an octopus a devourer of worlds who had sucked the souls of billions of sentient beings into oblivion. He also saw the true form of Siomborg, a gargantuan shrimp-like creature that fed on human flesh and sentient minds with an insatiable heart hunger. In that instant, Eric knew that neither of the Lords of Chaos could be allowed to wield the power of the Grey Sword. Ariok, if given the blade, would slay Siomborg and enslave trillions of innocent souls. Queen Siombark would destroy Ariok and use the multiverse as a feasting ground for her overwhelming hunger for flesh, blood, and knowledge. Neither reality must be allowed to come to pass, for each would shatter the cosmic balance. So Eric began to sing. Without any knowledge of the words, he invoked a great and terrible foreign rune, a song whose pitch and harmony changed the multiverse at a subatomic level, energizing the Higgs field of the multiverse, which is sorcerous power. Behind him, the steel ponies broke free from the queen's guards and magically manifested their instruments. They began to play in time with er Eric's rune sword, and the multiverse vibrated and changed to their tune. Planets exploded and suns burst into life under the power of the song. Gods and goddesses were born and died and rhythm and throbbed to of Tanya's bass licks, the pulse of Linda's drum beats, the melodic chords of Miss Mr. Sarantha's guitar, and the melody of Natasha's keyboard toccata and fugue. Wendy's voice joined with Eric's in the strange, seductive song. The song reached a crescendo, and there came a great cry. The crystal throne shattered and blossomed into a huge white dragon. It nuzzled the Amber Queen as if she were its pet. Then and the air split with a sound like a trillion thunderclaps, and there was a blast of indescribable heat and unfathomable colors, a psychedelic explosion of joy, pain, death, and rebirth. And then Eric held two swords. In his right hand, he held a five-foot-long broadsword carved with glowing red runes. They gave off a sickly black radiation. This was Stormbringer, and he bid Ariok to come and take it. Here is the instrument of your champions, Duke Ariok, Eric said. 
He felt a relief to be freed of Stormbringer, for its power powers were dreadful and depressing. He held in his left hand a bone white blade, whose fuller was carved with electric blue runes, which gave off sweet and comforting light, a beacon for lost souls. This blade he gave to Queen Siomborg. Here is the instrument to quench even your hunger, Queen Siomborg, Eric said. He was reluctant to release the white sword to a chaos lord, but knew it was not his to wield. It had many others, more worthy champions, to serve it. It is impossible, Queen, the Amber Queen laughed. He sang the rune of Thafnir, whose words, whose very rhythm are forbidden and forgotten. He separated the Grey Sword forever. It shall never be reunited. The cosmic balance is safe from its power for all eternity. As was his destiny, Mr. Sarantha replied, unplugging her cherry starburst Les Paul. Indeed, Natasha <coughs> laughed Natasha Vereshkova. He could no more avoid it than I could avoid playing along. You have served me well, Eric Porterfield von Beck, Queen Sionborg said. She sheathed the cloud hurler in a white leather scabbard at her left hip, but you also thwarted me and aided Ariok. For that, you shall both be rewarded and punished. For your reward, I shall reward you to your own, <coughs> restore you to your own beloved London, where you shall live in this year, 1969, forever, or at least until I need your services again. Your Aunt Valerie, my incarnation, shall guard you and keep you eternally young and happy. This is also your punishment, though you may not realize it for many centuries. There was a blinding white flash, and Eric and the Steel Ponies vanished from Megalondum. 6. 1969 Eric woke in a familiar room, a tang of portobello mushrooms on his tongue, and a strange song playing on his radio. It was 1969 by Iggy and the Stooges. He could not understand why the song haunted him. He gently extracted his arms and legs from those of his beautiful Aunt Valerie and went into the bathroom to brush his teeth. Eric thought he saw another woman standing in the center of the room. She was a beautiful buxom brunette with a horse's head and no shadow. But then he blinked and she, his eyes and she was gone. Clearly he was still hallucinating from Aunt Valerie's psychedelic mushrooms or maybe her LSD-infused lipstick. He wondered why the girl had lacked a shadow. That seemed an odd detail for a hallucination. Oh, darling, you're up, Aunt Valerie yawned. She stretched and brushed her slender hands through her flaxen hair. Her body was breathtaking in its perfection, a goddess in the flesh, every curve heavenly in the pale morning light. Eric adored her. Would you be a good boy and make your old auntie a cuppa? You're hardly old, Aunt Valerie, Eric commented, but I'll surely make you a cuppa. You want Earl Grey or the English breakfast? Earl Grey, dear boy, Valerie replied. She rose from the bed like a phoenix from the ashes, reborn in London's wan winter light. She pulled on an electric blue silk <coughs> robe <coughs> embroidered with red and yellow Chinese dragons and luck symbols. She brushed her teeth and combed out her long blonde hair, then returned to sit across from her nephew at the small, their small kitchen table. You've had another one of your dream quests, Valerie Gust. I can see a haunted look in your eyes. Where did you go this time? I can't exactly remember, Eric said. He poured Aunt Valerie a cup of tea in her TARDIS-shaped tea mug. It was London, but not our London. It was in the far future, and there were airships, huge skyscrapers, and people who could change their appearance and gender at will. Sounds groovy, Aunt Valerie purred. <clears throat> were there still good bands then? There was one, but they were my traveling companions, Eric recalled. He picked up a handbill from the table. It was a blue and, blue and white, and showed a background photograph of a beautiful buxom woman in a leather cat suit and horse head. The letters read, Come see the Steel Ponies, the grooviest band in London, 258 Baker Street, one night only, with Love Coven and the Kim Cat Band, 12 midnight, 6 May 1969. Come see the dazzling Conjure of the Millions, Conjuration of the Million Spheres Acid Light Show, come one, come all, tickets four pounds. This is the band, Eric said. The Steel Ponies, they were with me in that weird London, and so were you, Auntie. It was you, but another you, a different you. You were the queen. You were called the Amber Queen, and you had a dragon throne made of a huge fire opal that came alive. Wow, Aunt Valerie said. Those were some really good mushrooms your friend Rory Greenstock sold us. Yeah, Eric replied. I guess they were. But I think part of it was real. At least, I think part of it happened. If only in a dream. There was something else about a magic sword. I think that sword was real or, or is in some strange way. We're linked, that sword, you and me. Hmm. Aunt Valerie smiled. She ran her left foot up under, 
of Eric's thigh under the table. I can think of another <clears throat> sword that links us, young man. Eric laughed. Aunt Valerie, you're incorrigible, Eric said. Come back to bed and we'll see if your sword is magical, Aunt Valerie teased. But even as they made wild, passionate love, Eric felt an odd sense of being observed and a strange oppression. He felt as if he were another man in another time, whose name was not Eric, but Elric. In that world, he was a doomed prince of a race he himself had destroyed. Partly due to madness caused by Stormbringer, the Black Blade, Eric had freed from the Grey Sword. Ironically, his was the one soul that the White Sword could not save, because Queen Seombarg had kept the sword hidden from his alter ego. These images would haunt him through, through the, throughout the years, but would eventually fade. For now, it was 1969, and everything was groovy. The end.